This is Duke University. Hi, I'm Jennifer Weisenfeld at Duke University from the Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies. Um, I'm here representing the Rethinking Global Cities project funded by the Mellon Foundation. And um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce a visiting scholar and journalist who's here at Duke for a week-long series of events, Terrell Jones, a longtime foreign correspondent and business correspondent who's lived in Asia, particularly China, which will be the subject of our talk today, for over 16 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, Terrell, you worked with both um, the Associated Press and with Reuters, but your relationship with China goes back a long way, and you were there uh, already starting in 1976. What was Beijing like mm -hmm. in 1976? Um, uh, that's right. Uh, thanks for having me here, first of all. <laughs> Welcome. Um, the, uh, my first visit was before I had started college. Uh, in uh, 1976, I went as a teenager to visit relatives. My mother, who was from China, was able to get a visa to visit uh, relatives. I mean, we went to Shanghai. Three days after we got there, uh, on September 9th, 1976, Mao Zedong died. Mm. So that affected uh, the, our entire trip. Uh, when we got to Beijing after uh, two weeks, the funeral had already uh, taken place. Um, but what struck me more than the black armbands that everybody was wearing was the actual physical damage to the city from the Tangshan earthquake in uh, uh, July of 1976, where the death toll estimates run from 240,000 to 750,000 dead. Uh, and the, the city, there were piles of rubble everywhere. And it just struck me that as a capital uh, city of such a populous nation, it really seemed to be made out of a lot of rather flimsy brick houses, many of which collapsed. Mm. Uh, that's one of the lasting impressions uh, that I took away from my teenage visit to Beijing first time. So when you followed up and you went back again, um, this opportunity perhaps of a city in ruins, how mm. had it been rebuilt and when, when was your next visit? Well, I went back for the first time after that in 1982, so six years later, and I continued going throughout the 80s uh, up until 1989. And quite frankly, there weren't a lot of changes during the, the time physically to Beijing well, uh, over those, those visits. Um, <clears throat> there were, uh, uh, the, the society was you know, streams of bicyclists going to work and shopping and then going back. People taking walks, people sitting outside in the, uh, uh, in the hutong, in the, the alleys um, and on side streets. And that didn't really change uh, throughout the 1980s until the very end when you started to get some, some genuine construction of uh, new skyscrapers. So you started to see the emergence of the modern global city right at that particular moment? Uh, I'd, I'd say so, yes. In fact, I was looking at some of the videos I took uh, from 1989, uh, and uh, I noticed uh, buildings that were nearing completion that were very close to where I eventually lived. And I said, oh, wow, so that's when they went up. Because before that, Beijing had been a very low-level, flat city with only a few buildings over 20 stories tall. So um, in terms of these, these big changes, you mentioned the kind of changes in urbanism. Were there other kinds of changes that you saw in, in this time uh, when you went back in, in 1989? Um, well, I've been going from uh, almost every year from 85 to 89, oh, okay. uh, sometimes several times uh, a year. So in the second half of the 1980s, I'd say that, uh, again, there wasn't a lot of social or physical change except the, uh, the cityscape, the, so the skyline was, was growing. Um, there were two subway lines, but that didn't increase during that time. Uh, and uh, what, what was different was that the, the awareness and access to foreign information, media, images of the outside world increased. Uh, and I noticed a, a genuine growing curiosity uh, uh, among the Chinese about outside things, whether it be foreign movies, Japanese motorcycles, um, and, mm. uh, and fashion. And you were based in Tokyo during most of that time. Could you just say a little bit about the comparison of oh, those wow. two cities? That's, that, no, that's right. I was in, in Tokyo almost yeah. all of the 1980s, and all of my, my reporting trips and personal trips were made from Tokyo. So Tokyo, of course, was a, a gleaming, uh, expanding, busy, crowded metropolis you know, mm. full of commuters jammed in. Uh, into uh, trains and subways. And, and a city of screens, really, too. Lots of those. neon lights, uh, mm -hmm. lots, lots of Div uh, how do you say, um, uh, entertainment and choices of things to do, which was mm -hmm. really, all, it was very little of that in Beijing. If you lived in Beijing in the 1980s, you, uh, as foreigners, we congregated mostly in hotels and a couple of uh, 
clubs mm -hmm. because uh, we were obliged to live in one of only three compounds, mm -hmm. you know, all foreigners in Beijing. And there just weren't the, um, the, the, the nightlife and the entertainment and uh, uh, retail possibilities that there were later. Mm -hmm. So that must have been an interesting contrast going back and forth between those two places. So when you um, went in 1989, uh, and I should probably say to the audience that you're here because you were actually in, um, in Beijing during the Tiananmen Square student protests, but you were brought there for initially for a different reason. And then it, uh, tell us a little bit about the arc of that experience because it's really interesting. Well, I, I was in Beijing uh, starting in mid-May of 1989 for the same reason that there were hundreds of other foreign journalists in town, and that mm -hmm. was for the visit of Mikhail Gorbachev. And it was a Sino-Soviet summit mm -hmm. that uh, was a, uh, a kind of a detente and uh, ending of their own version of a Cold War mm -hmm. uh, estrangement for um, 30 years. And so it was a big deal between Beijing and Moscow, but of course of keen interest to Washington and to other uh, uh, countries uh, in the region and in fact around the world because mm -hmm. you know, two giant communist powers, nuclear powers, uh, who had been adversaries but then uh, making up uh, was of course a security concern. So that's why, <laughs> right. I, that's why I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but as just, I guess the world now knows, then uh, two days before uh, Mikhail Gorbachev arrived, students started a hunger strike on Tiananmen Square. That story snowballed and very quickly surpassed this momentous visit of the Soviet leader to the Chinese capital. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept so many of us there and I stayed for two months during that visit from what had originally been intended to be a 10-day visit. And when you were there, um, I just want to point out this is a really interesting uh, historical feature in terms of what I do, which is the history of photography and the history of visual culture, um, the moment of the photograph of the iconic Tank Man. And um, when Terrell was there, he also took a photograph, unbeknownst to him, of the Tank Man encounter of the man with the tanks. And that has been posted on uh, the New York Times Lens blog and commented on, and especially in the context of the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen. So certainly something to look at um, in terms of the history of that very iconic image. So you're really the, the fifth photographer of that, of those. Uh, fifth uh, known one, I the suppose. The first yes. known, I suppose. It's, it's yeah. the alternate view of the man <laughs> versus tank. Yeah, yeah. It's taken a couple of minutes before the famous confrontation that we all know from the right. bird's eye view. And this was taken from ground level where you see him standing very erect and resolute waiting for the tanks who are that are still quite a distance away to come mm. toward him. And what's been the reaction to that, that photograph in terms of that moment in Beijing history? It's been a, a much more emotional than I had uh, imagined, although I probably should have imagined that. I mean, it is, the pictures that we know are very iconic, instantly recognizable. This one, the man is very small, and I actually missed him for I don't know, weeks and maybe a few months uh, after I had uh, first printed the photo when I went back to, to Tokyo. Uh, but the reaction has been um, a very strong emotion. Many comments uh, have said that they have an entirely different perspective of the act of defiance that he carried out. Others said that this, uh, it, it's, th they're moved by the simple fact that a single image coming out decades later can provide just a completely different perspective to a well-known point in, in, in history. Mm. And that doesn't happen that much, um, I suppose. And, um, and I, it, it did take me somewhat by surprise because I didn't expect mm. all of this. I really didn't think about what the reaction might be. I just thought that, well, maybe some people might be interested. Yeah. Well, it is a st it's a stunning photograph and, and really changed my view of that, that iconic series as well. So you've been back um, several times and recently for a three year stint working with Reuters. Can you tell us a little bit over the, perhaps in the last decade or so, um, how you've really seen Beijing develop or even maybe from the, from the Beijing Olympics and, and what well, you see are some of the critical issues of urbanism and urban development that are. My, my first direct taste of the new Beijing, uh, developed Beijing was during the Olympics. I went back mm -hmm. for uh, the second week uh, of those, those games and that's when you know, I, I sort of knew what to expect because I knew there were big buildings. I knew there was this uh, oddly shaped uh, new CCTV, China's central television building. Mm -hmm skyscrapers, lights, restaurants, nightlife, things like that. But then driving down Chang'an Boulevard, which is the main east-west uh, avenue in Beijing that crosses, uh, goes right in front of uh, Tiananmen Square and the Gate of Heavenly Peace, um, it, it was lined with tall buildings, you know, office buildings, um, hotels, lots of lights, 
lots of traffic. So mm -hmm. the, the, I was immediately, I was, I was struck by really two things on that uh, visit, was the, uh, the amount of traffic as opposed to bicycles, car traffic. Right. And then that's the number of uh, consumer and retail diversions that were available to people. Mm -hmm. uh, there are just so many little restaurants, little corner places, holes in the wall, as a, and then big fancy places, mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and shopping. You know, it's the, the whole consumer mentality uh, and wanting to keep up with the rest of the world, and then thus not looking that different from Tokyo, in fact, mm. uh, many parts of it. Um, by that time were, were what really struck me as the big changes. And you mentioned at the beginning that foreign visitors and journalists would be more um, clumped in particular areas. Do you see a much more diverse kind of urban population well, walk, work, walking well, around the went, city? When I went there in 2010 to actually to live there for, mm -hmm. for long term and actually look for an apartment for myself, mm. um, uh, yes, I mean, there, I, was, I was actually stunned uh, that not only foreigners did not have to live in these exclusive compounds, but they mixed, you know, intermixed uh, with Chinese renters uh, uh, randomly. You know, there wasn't a quota, there wasn't uh, a, uh, limitations. I mean, if you could afford you know, the apartment, then you mm -hmm. could live there. Uh, and then the choices were vast. Uh, I mean, yes, they're still concentrated on certain areas of, uh, of Beijing, but there are you know, there are scores and scores of apartment complexes, even more um, communities of villas out by the airport, which are, excuse me, mostly uh, uh, inhabited by, by foreigners. And then it's opened up to if you wanted to live in a Chinese neighborhood in a Chinese building, mm -hmm. uh, nothing's stopping you. Uh, you don't, uh, you're not restricted from that. And so I, I applaud that. I'm glad that there was this intermingling of uh, foreign visitors and, and Chinese residents. Um, although it is separated by the wealth gap, you know, only those who can afford it can, can right. live there. So this really uh, juggernaut of development in Beijing, what, do you see issues of urban development or other things that really struck you as um, critical issues for the city? Well, there are a couple of problems. One is mainly for uh, Chinese residents mm -hmm. and one is for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem do facing uh, a lot of uh, Beijing residents is simply the cost of housing and the availability of housing. Uh, and, and then the traffic, you know, it's so hard to get, mm -hmm. get around by car. When I first arrived in Beijing, there were uh, 60,000 new cars put on Beijing streets oh every month. <laughs> every, every month. Mo every month. Uh, and wow. that was uh, when I got there in uh, 2010. From January right. 2011, the authorities uh, required a lottery so that uh, they're now, they restrict new car registrations to 20,000 uh, per month. Mm -hmm. But uh, so the housing and traffic, the traffic does affect everybody, but the housing is a real pr a problem going ahead for uh, for Chinese people. Does that make the broader mm -hmm. development, are people just living farther and farther out, which they, is what they, happened they, in Tokyo they, too? They, they really are because Beijing uh, has expanded uh, uh, monumentally since I was first there. It has a series of ring roads and the second ring road was kind of the limit to every place I went in 1989. There wasn't a lot beyond that. Now, when I lived there you know, mm -hmm. m most recently, I'd go to take uh, kids to a sporting uh, practice out on the fifth ring road, which is much farther yeah. away. But mm -hmm. the other problem I said that faces everybody is, of course, the pollution. Right. And that is something that is a, uh, a, a very hazardous byproduct of China's and Beijing's breakneck development that, is, uh, is, uh, that we all know now and mm -hmm. joke about, but it's something that the authorities really have to address seriously. So going forward in the next, say, 10 years or so, what do you think are some of the major hurdles, obviously reducing the air pollution and other forms of pollution? Well, uh, aside from, from that, uh, which affects mm. everybody, another problem that uh, is growing and kind of not really addressed by authorities is the uh, migrant population right. uh, and uh, uh, flows of population in and out. But the migrant population, because of the laws of China, they don't, uh, those workers don't, uh, have eligibility for a hukou, you know, a Chinese family registration mm -hmm. in Beijing, which will allow their children to go to schools, will allow them to register for medical care, buy an mm -hmm. apartment. So they're outcast citizens of estimated about, excuse me, seven million <laughs> in the city. Uh, uh, that wow. is a huge, <laughs> huge number. Right that you can't continue to ignore. Uh, and, and that's so, a social problem. And really. that's, not, that's not just Beijing, but you know, it is a problem in Beijing as it is uh, mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere, anywhere where there's a lot of construction going on. And so it's, it's a social problem of uh, education for these uh, people, healthcare, um, uh, infrastructure for just you know, f uh, 
food, goods, transportation, how is that going to be served? And that is something that authorities are looking at in a long-term planning, uh, but it is uh, part of the major set of urban challenges uh, to uh, the Chinese and the Beijing leadership. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful to <laughs> speak with you. Thanks very much. <laughs>